हे भगवान 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 आई बाव टू द लॉर्ड भगवान आई बाव टू हिम इन यू I bow to him in all beings, and above all, I bow to him in my Guru. I hope that through these programs, you are beginning to get something of a more three-dimensional picture of what my Guru is like, and through that, what you really are like too. Because most people forget that higher dimension, you could call it a fourth dimension, the dimension of their own spiritual truth and reality. Dr. Lewis, Yogananda's first Kriya Yoga disciple in America, told us many fascinating stories from his long years of association with the Master. There was a man, he said, who had been wrongly condemned to death. The case was widely reported in the papers. Almost everyone thought it an obvious case of miscarriage of justice. I told the master about it with some indignation. He paused and looked very serious. Then he withdrew into himself. When he resumed normal consciousness, he was smiling. Soon thereafter, the condemned man was pardoned. Was the master responsible for his reprieve? He himself said nothing about it. I had known him already long enough, however, to have my own private suspicions. My guru took an active interest in the lives of so many people, people he never met, people he'd never known but met just for a moment. I told that story uh, recently about the time that he was out driving with a fellow disciple of mine, and uh, he passed a shop and suddenly he said, stop the car, stop the car. So the driver pulled over to the curb, and uh, Yoganandaji walked back to that shop, which was really just a poor variety shop, nothing of interest in it. Master bought a few items, and my friend was thinking, what on earth is he buying these things for? They couldn't possibly serve him any practical use. And then my guru went to the counter, and the old lady who owned the store added everything up. When he paid her, she burst into tears. She said, I very badly needed this money today, and closing time was almost here, and I had, I had given up hope. Surely it was God himself who sent you, sir. My guru didn't say anything to her or to anybody. He just took it, but nobody ever saw him use those things again. He did it out of compassion for her. He had an active concern for people. And there is an area in Los Angeles Street. At that time, that area was called Los Angeles Street. And I I don't know whether that kind of scene has moved elsewhere. That was a long time ago. It was when I lived there, yes. But it was the sort of bar district of Los Angeles. And, um, Many people went there just to drink and get drunk. And my guru sometimes would just walk up and down outside those bars. He didn't say anything, but you knew he was trying to help those poor people. The consciousness of people who uh, 
get into drinking is also pulled down by lower entities. Right? My guru is helping on an astral level to clean the area up so that people would not be so affected. There is a song um, by George Frederick Handel, where ere you walk cool gales shall fan the glade, trees where you sit shall crowd into a shade. This is how it was with our guru. And the thing is that if everybody in the world could learn to live in sattvic consciousness, the world would not be the ugly place it is. The deserts would bloom, really. The whole world would become more beautiful and more natural. All the, the uh, uh, ugliness in the world and all the beauty in the world is the result, not entirely, but to a very great extent, of human consciousness. The Sahara, they know that underneath it, it was very green at one time. Same thing with the, with the uh, Gobi Desert. The desert areas are often areas where there is a karmic need to cleanse old vibrations and so on. I was talking recently about the, the uh, yugas, and I mentioned that uh, the descending yuga into Kali does not suddenly become Satya yuga. Then it becomes an ascending Kali. There's a descending and an ascending. Finally, it gets to Satya yuga, the golden or spiritual age of truth. And when it reaches that peak, then it doesn't suddenly become anything. It just continues, but on a downward trend. This is the way of nature. We don't know anything that is different. It's really a very odd superstition that suddenly this should be an exception. But the interesting thing is that because we have now come up into an age of energy, but from an age of total material absorption, therefore we think, our, our, our bias is to think, how can I manipulate things? What kind of machinery can do this? We think in terms of correcting imbalances by force or by uh, material um, inventions and so on. If you look at the downward trend from uh, before that, say three, four thousand years ago and less, you will see that there is a, another kind of bias altogether because they have come down from Trita Yuga, the Satya Yuga, which is really God conscious primarily. Then there is Trita Yuga where people begin to use mental power and they use, warfare is introduced in Teta Yuga. There is no war As after some time into Teta Yuga coming up again. In Satya Yuga, there is no war. But in Treta, as it's coming down and as consciousness, people's consciousness diminishes in its refinement, there is a, an inclination to use mental power uh, to hurt others, to defend oneself. And so you find introduced, even then, the principles of black magic. And you see that in those days, people thought to do everything, if possible, by magic. This is why the um, Vedic ceremonies and so on often deal with uh, um, ceremonies that will help you to accomplish things that in this day and age, the bias would be to think, well, what can I do physically? to make things happen. And I have thought quite seriously that the, as it's called, the black continent of Africa, um, it isn't that black people are lower than anybody. We're all the same human beings with the same capacity for uh, rising spiritually and materially and intellectually in every other way. But I think what happened, and you can see the residue of it in, in Africa today, there's a lot of black magic. I think that black magic came down from a higher age and they got steeped in it. And as a result of that, they um, lost their power and uh, have had to work their way out of it. But it was interesting when I was in Egypt, I had never felt drawn to Egypt, but there was a group of people who wanted to, to uh, 
go to Egypt, and they invited me to lead this group. Actually, it was not that I had much to say on this group, but the people who did have something to say wanted me to bring some of my people there. And so I did, just thinking that Egypt was the sort of thing everybody had to do at least once in his lifetime. I felt, as I said, no special attraction. But uh, um, when I went to Aswan, I, I uh, had this feeling that I had been there before. I had the feeling that I had lived in an ashram and that it was all green there then. And I suddenly, the image that you get of, of uh, Egypt through the bas-reliefs and so on is of a kind of a very formal and staid culture. It was what I remembered was very human and warm and loving and beautiful. But later on, the group and I went to the Cairo Museum and I didn't feel any attraction there. I felt as if there was a black magic there. And it occurred to me very strongly that that ancient culture too had fallen into uh, black magic practices and that's why it had fallen. Now, in India didn't. India always maintained its high devotion to God. This is what has preserved India even through the Dark Ages and up, the disintegrating influences of time are um, uh, such that all other civilizations have vanished. Only India is still there. And yes, India has had to go through the, has had to be subjected to those disintegrating influences, but part of those disintegrating influences are the poverty of India is not necessarily uh, all that ancient. You know, Marco Polo, the Italian uh, explorer, adventurer, he went through India, came through India on his way back to Italy. This was back in the year 1200 and something, if I recall correctly. And he said at that time that India is the richest country in the world. He had seen many countries. This is what he said about India. Now, it's interesting that India, in a very short time, lost its wealth, became one of the poorest countries. And an interesting sequel, I should say correlation to that, is that India, as India lost its wealth, India gained it. Uh, you just sort of suspect a cause and effect relationship there. I remember a woman in Athens, she was our guide, and... Uh, she was talking how Elgin, whom uh, English people think of as a great benefactor of their country, bringing all these wonderful ancient things to India, she said that he would knock the heads off beautiful statues in order to give them more, more value as relics. And uh, I, she asked me at one point where I thought the real civilization came from that was ancient Greek with all its legends of the, the, the gods and goddesses on Mount Olympus and so on. And I said, from India. She said, nobody knows that. It's amazing you do. But it is a fact. India was the mother culture and it will remain the guru of this world. The culture of India is such that it is the guru of the world. It has produced its greatest wealth, has always been those few great men and women who have known God. When Alexander went to India, he heard about the great yogis. And uh, he wanted to meet one, and he sent word that this yogi should, uh, should come to see him. He was the conquering emperor, and he thought he had a right to demand. And uh, he said, but if he didn't, he would take his head off. It's sort of the old way of kings, I suppose. The yogi sent back word saying that if he wants my head, he can have it. It's of no use to me. And he says that if I have anything that he wants, he must come to me. I will not go to him because the gold and riches that he offers me are of no value at all. 
The threats that he offers me have no interest to me. I have realized what I have been born for. And whether I die now or die in a few years, it doesn't matter to me at all. With that answer to his fairly compulsive summons, Alexander went to him. And it's an interesting thing because Alexander, my guru said, was Hitler in this life. And he also had a sort of a, an attraction to India, an attraction to the mystic things. My guru was hoping that he could awaken those old samskaras, but there were others that were too strong and pulled him into pride and all the things that cause people to fall. But the beauty of this world would be so much more so will be so much more so when people change. But as long as there is this anger and hatred and violence, the world will be full of suffering and uh, unkindness and lack of beauty. There will be ugliness everywhere. And even the beauty that exists seems to be diminishing at this time. It won't last. But I wrote this song, Emerald Isle, with the thought in mind that when consciousness is beautiful, then everything in nature becomes beautiful also. I hope you enjoy it. Joy to you. Come here while I sing you of emerald hills, of valleys and meadows so fair, that all who have seen them have carried away. Memories in their hearts, friends, like the lilacs of May. Oh, my song is the story of the lilacs of May. My song is the story of deer on the hills, of larks that soar seeking the sun. Of nightingales lifting the curtain of night As with music they bring down heaven's blessing of light Oh, my song is the story of God's blessing of light Come join me in singing of that emerald of flowers that like jewels besprinkle the lea, of waterfalls eager to embrace the wide sea, as we with our Maker united would be, as we with our Maker reunited would be. Come here while I sing you of emerald hills, of valleys and meadows so fair, that all who have seen them have carried away. Memories in their hearts, friends, of the lilacs of May, Oh, my song is the story of the lilacs of May.